Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome back to another episode of the Modern Bar Cart Podcast. I'm your host, Modern Bar Cart CEO Eric Koslick. This time around, we chat with craft distiller Nate Grindendike, who, along with his brother in law and business partner Jeff Harner, created Saint Froid Distilling in Hyattsville, Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C. Saint Froid, or if you want to Germanicize it, Sang Freud, is a French term for keeping your cool under pressure. Literally translated, it means cold blooded. During the interview, we'll hear the full story of how the company got its name, as well as why they chose to focus on traditional Dutch and French spirits. But you know what? You're looking a little dry right now. So I think first, we need to give you the chance to make yourself a drink. Because we talk about and taste some delicious Jennifer this episode, our featured cocktail is the Improved Holland's Gin Cocktail. This is a classic from legendary bartender Jerry Thomas, a.k.a. The Professor, who published one of the first official cocktail recipe books back in the late 1800s. Now, if we take the term cocktail to mean a drink comprised of a spirit, sugar, and bitters, then what the heck is an improved cocktail? Well, in general, when you come across this term in the cocktail world, it usually refers to a drink that adds a little something else besides sugar and bitters to the base spirit. Unfortunately, there's a lot of conflicting recipes out there on the internet for the improved Holland's Gin cocktail, so I'm going to try and synthesize them all into one recipe template that you can tweak to your own personal flavor preferences. To make this drink, you'll need two ounces of Jennifer, that's the Holland's Gin, a quarter ounce of maraschino liqueur or Grand Marnier. We'll return to that option in just a second. A quarter ounce of simple syrup, several dashes of aromatic bitters. We of course like to use our embitterment aromatic bitters. And finally, one half bar spoon of absinthe. Just a very, very small amount of that. Combine all the ingredients in a mixing glass with ice, stir until chilled and well integrated, and then strain into a nice stemmed cocktail glass and garnish with a lemon twist. A few notes on the ingredients here. The decision between maraschino liqueur and Grand Marnier is a pretty simple one. If you're looking for an end result that's soft and nutty, go with the maraschino, but if you'd like to play up the citrus notes, opt for the Grand Marnier. Either way, it's gonna come out pretty nice and they both have kind of similar sweetness levels, so you can swap them out pretty interchangeably on that front. I think the more divisive ingredient here is the absinthe. This is something you want to add in very, very small amounts. So if you have an atomizer at your disposal, that's a great way to incrementally ramp up the absinthe in very minute and carefully controlled quantities until you've got the drink perfectly tuned for your palate. So now that you've got yourself a little improved glass of Dutch courage, let's turn our attention back to the interview. In this craft spirits conversation and tasting with distiller Nate Grindendike, some of the topics we discuss include how a duo of spirits enthusiasts converted their love for craft spirits into an agricultural and distilling operation that's pumping out delicious apple brandy, Dutch style gin, and soon Maryland rye whiskey. A comparison of Dutch style gin and London dry gin, specifically looking at differences in production methods, flavor profiles, and cocktail applications. We also dig deep into all the little choices that each craft distiller must make regarding ingredient sourcing, fermentation, distillation, and maturation that all build upon one another to create the unique fingerprint of each distillery. Nate fantasizes about traveling back in time to let his great-grandfather in the Netherlands taste his version of Jennifer. I ask some typical probing questions about barrels and mash bills, and we both sample a little bit of saint Foy's delicious Holland-style gin. I had a great time visiting the distillery and checking out all the amazing stuff Nate and Jeff are working on. And for our listeners in the D.C. area, I do highly, highly recommend you go and visit when you've got a free afternoon at some point. There's ample parking located in several public lots within a few blocks of the distillery so that you don't have to park on busy Route 1. So keep your eyes peeled for those if you decide to take a day trip. And that being said, 
I hope you enjoy this malty, distilled, and slightly cold-blooded conversation with distiller Nate Grenendike of Safwa Distilling. Nate, thanks for being on the podcast. All right, great to be here. So can you introduce yourself to our listeners and uh, give us uh, just a quick 30 second, like, how'd you get here? All right. Well, uh, my name is Nate Grunendike and my brother-in-law, Jeff Harner, and I are doing this business. So it's a family business. Uh, we, I'm a former educator. I was in education for 15 years. So, and my brother-in-law still works for the government. Uh, I quit my job. So I'm here doing this full time, trying to make uh, really good spirits for Hyattsville and Maryland and DC area. Mm Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, congrats on that. It's a big step to kind of cut the cord. Uh, can I ask where you were a teacher? Uh, so I worked all over the country. I was. I started off in Los Angeles, uh, high school math, uh, then Rhode Island, and then worked at a charter school here as an instructional coach for a couple of years. Uh, and then now I'm doing this. It's, I kind of say the uh, Breaking Bad, but uh, the legal part of it. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's everyone has a story for how they come to be the person running the stills. Uh, so I take it you're the person who is actually doing the distilling and then Jeff is more of like the sales side or some of the softer stuff? Yeah, absolutely. We have a good split of labor. So I do a lot of the distilling, day-to-day mashing, uh, fermenting, then distilling and bottling. And he helps out when he can. And he's also here on weekends when we're open for tastings. So Right. Cool. And education, too, is like such a huge part of getting a distillery off the ground, especially a, dis- a distillery like yours that has a bit of a specialization. So can you tell us a little bit about the, I guess, the brand story and the spirit story of Sangfred Distilling? Sure. Jeff and I, like I said, we're brother-in-laws. And so we've been working together for about 10 years as home brewers and home cider makers. Makers. And as we've grown in that craft, uh, we've exposed ourselves to a, a lot of different higher end alcohols, specifically beers, and then into really good ciders. And then started drinking uh, an offshoot of cider called Calvados, which is a French style apple brandy. And we were blown away by it. And we loved it. And we were trying to find it around the the United States, and it was really hard to find anything that was locally made. We found some people that were calling it apple brandy, but it tasted nothing like the Calvados that we were getting from France. So we saw this as an opportunity that we could really jump into the game and produce something the traditional way that they're doing. Uh, They're making their Calvados in France and do the same types of methods here and produce something that nobody else is doing. Yeah, it's that dry, earthy, but also kind of sun-kissed characteristic that you that you really can't find in too too many other brandies from anywhere else. True, true, and so that re- that then opened up our eyes to a lot of other European styles of liquors, including the Genever uh, style of gin, which we also do here today. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, is there? By my estimation, Sangfroid means cold-blooded. Is, yeah. <laughs> is there is there a story there? Uh, there is a story. It's it's interesting. Uh, it was definitely not our first name of the distillery. Really, there are a lot of hurdles uh, that we had to jump through, and there are a lot of times that I specifically did not believe we were going to make it. And I oftentimes would lose my cool and be like, "That's it. We're done. We can't do this. Let's let's just go about our lives." And he's at one point he said, "Nate, maintain your sang froid." And I, I was like, "What does that mean?" And he was uh, he said, "Well, it's an SAT word. I remember it from high school, uh, but it kind of means you just got to chill out." So uh, you know, we I looked it up. I was like, "Yeah, I got to chill out just a little bit. We got to just stay the course, keep going forward." And uh, and it's it's really uh, been a mantra for us uh, as we move through this process of opening distillery, which has been a three to four year process for us. Uh, and something when you first start, you think, yeah, yeah, I could do this in maybe six months uh, to a year, get it open. Uh, but there are so many barriers set up that uh, you really have to, to to keep your eye on the prize and keep moving forward. Yeah, there, there really are a lot of barriers. And we've had episodes in the past where we've discussed with uh, more historically oriented folks how a lot of the regulations that we have today arose. A lot of them arose out of prohibition. Uh, and we're still kind of dealing with the specters, the ghost of prohibition. And so that's one of the things that when I walk into to a, a new craft distillery like this one, it, it really is just a, a treat to me to be able to, to look that person in the eye and know exactly <laughs> what they went through because it does make the juice taste just that much better. It, it really does to me too, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, before we move on to talking about the really cool spirits uh, that you're distilling and your approach to taking those things, as you mentioned off air just a moment ago from grain to glass, preference thing. Do you want people to do the American or Germanicized pronunciation of your brand, Sangfroid, or do you, do you like that French sang Uh, 
I say, you say it however you feel comfortable saying it. Okay. We're fine with anything. It even says on our bottle, uh, however you pronounce it, the meaning's the same. So I love it. I love it. That's so good. Cool. So let's talk about your spirits then. Starting with the Calvados, it seems like that was the first spirit that you really fell in love with. So let's start there. And then as we talk about these things, we're going to taste some stuff. And as a disclaimer for the folks who are going to be listening at home, the stuff is not out of the barrel yet. Most of these are barrel aged spirits. Um, so can you just tell us where you are at? right now in production and that, so that, that when they hear us tasting these things they can kind of uh, gauge where you're at sure Cur- uh, we currently we're about six weeks open so we have just been producing as much and as much as we can uh, obviously clear spirits are the first things that you can put in bottles and sell and so that's why the what we have right now uh, is our dutch style gin we actually opened up with a clear pair eau de vie brandy uh, and sold out in the first week uh, okay, congrats because it, yeah. it was so great and it was a pretty tough Tough year for uh, fruit uh, with all the rain, so we did not have the yield uh, in terms of pears. So we'll, we'll ramp that up next year. But like I said, we have our Jennifer right now that we're selling, and in barrels we have rye whiskey aging, and we have uh, Calvados style apple brandy aging, uh, as well as some of our gin. We're doing a barrel aged gin as well. Okay, so we've we talked in the past on the Modern Bar Cart podcast about various varieties of gin, and it seems like. Dutch style is it's almost like the 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 gin that, that predates what we today understand to be gin is that is that fair sure absolutely it's actually the the origin of gin in the late 1500s that's when they started this Jennifer uh, which is the Dutch word for juniper and so they would steep juniper berries in high proof alcohol and sell it as medicine so it started off as a medicine the government sort of caught wind of that and was like all right we're gonna start taxing this and now it's the national spirit of the Netherlands. I'm of Dutch heritage, and so as I was growing up, uh, my grandparents would say, the gin that you guys are drinking, that's not gin. And, <laughs> I, and, I, was, and I had no idea what they were talking about, and but it stuck with me, and then as we started exploring these other types of European liquors, when Jennifer came up, light bulb went off in my head and said, I remember them talking about it, and we, we started drinking it and fell in love with it too. Mm-hmm. So uh, that was the impetus for us to have that as one of our main spirits here. So what do you like about Jennifer? And then I guess in a more big picture way, how does it significantly differ from uh, what people understand as like a London dry style? Sure. So the, the difference is why I like it. And so what happened was the English took a hold of the Jennifer, and they found a way to make it quicker, uh, faster, and on scale. And so basically, a London dry gin now is a vodka. You make a vodka first, which means, uh, by definition, you have to run it up to 95% alcohol. When you do that, you strip away all the flavors of the grains that you used to create that alcohol. That means any botanicals you add are going to really be at the forefront of that spirit. Mm -hmm. And so a London dry is really heavy on the botanicals, and sometimes some people... Uh, compare it to eating a pine tree, right? It isn't going to be that uh, that much coming into you. The Dutch style uh, is much more grain forward. So you never run it up anywhere near 95% alcohol because we're trying to maintain the grain characteristics. And we use the traditional grains of rye and barley, so uh, which is the same grain bill we use for our rye whiskey. And so when you drink our Jennifer, you're getting a little bit of that botanical up front, uh, but it's a much more balanced spirit in terms of some botanical, but then finishes almost like a like a rye whiskey uh, with some sweetness and some peppery on the back end. Right. So when, when most dry gins are produced, you've got a column still, correct? And a lot of these, um, the folks who are, are making the gin will use what's called a a gin basket, which is basically a little mesh or wire basket that they put their botanicals in. Sometimes they'll layer them in a specific way to get a a desired effect. And then as the alcohol vapors kind of go up through the plates and pass through that gin basket, that's where the flavor is going to infuse. Now, do you use a a similar method for infusing the botanicals in Jennifer or do you do a post-distillation maceration? So we macerate in the still, our low wines. Uh, mm-hmm. So our first run of our rye and barley, we put into the still, and then I put in, it's almost like a big tea bag okay. uh, with 
juniper, coriander, and angelica root, and I let that steep or macerate in there for three or four days. Then I run the still with the tea bag in there, and so you're getting a lot of those oils and flavors that come off at different temperatures mm-hmm. as the low wines heat up to produce the final spirit. So you're actually, instead of using a botanical or a gin basket, you're putting it in the belly of the still. Absolutely. Okay. That's a really interesting distinction. I don't think I would have necessarily thought about that or known that before I walked into this. All right, so we've got some distillation differences, and so I'm looking at your setup behind us here, and your stills, it looks like you've got some plates in there. Uh, can you just talk about the, I guess, the the layout of the still and the, the impact that that has on, on the product that you're creating? Sure. So we have two different stills. We have a traditional Lambic style pot still, and that's where we do our fruit brandies and our rye whiskey runs. Uh, and we do that because that's the traditional way that those spirits have been made. Our other still, our it's a hybrid column pot still, uh, we use that specifically for gin. And we use that specifically for gin uh, because of all the oils that are coming off from the juniper, the coriander, and the angelica root. That maceration uh, produces a lot of oils that we don't want to ever possibly taint our fruit brandies or our rye whiskey when we're doing that. Okay, and so you're doing the rye whiskey in the Olympic pot still as well? Correct. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, sounds like nerdy talk. Uh, until you really taste some of this stuff side by side. And the more you go into these craft distilleries and, and even some of the, the very large distilleries, uh, you, you can really start to understand the impact that the size, shape, and, and layout of their distillation process and equipment has on the end product. Uh, so that's always something that I, I like to, to ask when, when I'm visiting a distillery for the first time because it, it's almost a way for, for you as a consumer to get the fingerprint of the distiller, really understand what makes that place unique. And that to me is one of the big value propositions of being able to visit and patronize craft distilleries is because you, you get to meet the people. We're sitting yeah. here talking face to face. It's not a, it's not a computer turning out a bunch of corn juice in, in uh, you know, the Midwest somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, so great. So can we, can we taste, uh, get our lips on something and, uh, and, and talk about uh, you know, what we might taste in there and what we might use it for in the cocktail space? Sure. So we're going to do our Dutch style gin. uh, And I've got it, uh, the way that I drink it is chilled. Uh, I like it chilled or over an ice cube. So we're going to start uh, just with it chilled uh, straight. Great. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and join you. Beautiful. And so actually what I'm going to have you do is just drink about half of it. Sure. uh, Sip half of it just to get the full flavor of it. And what you're going to get is a little juniper up front. And then uh, it's going to smooth out to almost a rye whiskey finish, but very grain forward. It's very grain forward on the nose. Uh, definitely getting that rye and the barley. Um, you, you get a little little bit of sweetness from the barley, and then from you know that that rye is just so distinctive. While I'm tasting this, uh, can you speak to where you source your grains from? So we get our grains from all over. We are working with several different malsters here in the Maryland area, and. Pennsylvania. Uh, So uh, trying to do as many local grains as possible. And, you know, one of the challenges of working with smaller places that you're getting different types of grains at different types of years. And so you're getting different mashes and that's giving us different fermentations and different flavors. But uh, it's it's a fun problem to have because it's almost it's almost like a fun puzzle that we're working out together uh, with these uh, grain producers. Right. Whenever you're sourcing ingredients for folks who are, um, you know, not familiar with the distillation process or, you know, what it takes to run a distillery, which is most of us who are listening to this podcast, we've never really run distilleries. Ingredient sourcing is an interesting problem to have because when you're, especially when you're supporting local, you're getting uh, different terroirs. The literal weather and soil that this stuff is grown in is going to vary. And as you have to adjust to other large market forces, by its very nature, what is coming out of your still is going to change. Uh, and so you can choose to look at that as a problem, right? It's a problem of consistency, or you can choose to really get into the local nature of that and, and try to appreciate the differences. And the best way to appreciate those is to ask your distiller a little bit about it, right? So, sure. And so the next thing we're going to do is I'm going to add just a few drops of water. And this simulates 
sort of the melting of an ice cube, mm -hmm. which is how I, actually I drink it at home is over ice. And so as the ice melts and um, the water comes in, it's almost like adding the water to a scotch or a whiskey. It's going to mm -hmm. open up a little bit. It's going to subdue the juniper a little bit more, but it's going to really open up the sweetness of that rye and barley. So. Right. Yeah. So before we put the water in, some of the flavor notes that I was getting from this is that characteristic, uh, that little rye mintiness that you get um, from, from that particular grain. Um, and then and some interesting little fruitiness as well. You definitely got some of the angelica in there, which is one of my favorite gin botanicals across the spectrum, whether we're talking Geneva or uh, London dry style. And then on the finish, I almost got, I get like this really soft, almost like a, a melon rind to it. It's, it's very, um, you know, you can tell that you're not drinking something that was distilled up to, you know, 95% because there's just so much, um, so much of a distinct finish that lingers for a while. So now I'm going to try it um, with the addition of that water. It definitely opened up. You get more sweetness on the nose as well with that for sure. And interestingly enough, you know, you say that the juniper is maybe subdued a little bit, but I think that the botanicals, the influence of the botanicals overall with the addition of that water is really nice and balanced. Uh, I think maybe part of that is because of the, the, the temperature, because it was chilled a little bit. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's really nice balance. And um, you do get a change in mouthfeel. It's a little bit less viscous when you add that water, as you might expect. But the mouth coating, I actually find, was was more um, more full when I, when I got that little bit of dilution. Mm -hmm. So really cool experience overall. And, uh, you know, most times people just don't sit around sipping gin. So it's always a cool ex experience when I get to just sit and sip a gin. You really get to know your spirit well. Yeah. And that's that's one of the reasons that I really like Jennifer is that it is a sipping gin and you don't have to make a cocktail out of it. And a lot of gin cocktails are actually meant to cut the flavor of gin down. Uh, and so we really enjoy just drinking this on the rocks. Uh, but we do have some fun cocktails that we make with it. For sure, for sure. And I think on the cocktail side of things, the, the real appeal of Jennifer is that it is somewhere in that middle ground between whiskey and gin. And whiskey and gin are, in my opinion, the two undisputed heavyweights in the cocktail world. Those are the two best spirits to use when making cocktails, by and large, on the, on the classic side of things. And so I think that's why it does appeal so much to the craft bartenders out there who are looking to really set their programs apart. So um, hopefully we can uh, come back to cocktails here in, in a moment, but I did want to ask a little bit more about the cultural side of things. So, so you said that Jennifer was uh, a sipping whiskey or a sipping, uh, sipping spirit rather. Um, how, how did people consume it, um, you know, thinking back to like your, your grandparents or your relatives, yeah, well, how did they drink it? So the traditional way is to uh, pour it in a glass and you take it, take it as a shot okay. and then drink a, a cheap beer on the side. Okay. Uh, I mean, that's the traditional way in Netherlands that they drink it. Um, and so um, as, as cocktails became more uh, prevalent, now it, experimentation has happened and there are lots of different cocktails that you can make with a Jennifer and, and really every Jennifer uh, has its own taste and because it's made in, a, in different ways and so you can't ever say this is a one Jennifer cocktail that's going to work for all Jennifers across the spectrum you really have to play with the one that's in front of you to find the right proportions and the right mixers yeah it's really interesting thinking geographically speaking about the way that people consumed spirits and really like <sighs> The Netherlands is in a part of the world where you do experience seasons. You get extreme cold. It tends to be, I mean, it's, it's a lowland cold climate, so maybe it's not as intense as like an alpine cold, but you really do see this kind of band of cultures across Europe, starting at the Atlantic with the Netherlands and then going back through Germany and kind of getting into like more of the, the Eastern European countries where there is this tradition of whatever you're distilling it gets taken with a shot next to a beer. Mm -hmm. And it's just this, it's this interesting little band of culture that you can kind of trace back, you know? So maybe, you know, in the, in, in Germany and Switzerland, you're, you're having schnapps. Uh, and then maybe in Eastern Europe, you're doing something like a damson plum brandy or something like that. But across that little band, it's, it's just interesting how the climate of the place where the spirits are being produced has that influence on, on how it's consumed traditionally. And, um, you know, it's, it's also funny when you take, 
take that and you package it up and bring it to the United States, we look at it as being completely non-traditional to our culture. And we just try and like see how we can use it in a cocktail. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, you know, that's one thing that we try to do with our spirits is we want them to be, uh, consumed however you like them, but, uh, but definitely able to be consumed without having to mix them. So mm -hmm. we're, we want to make something that's high enough quality that you can sip over ice or, or neat uh, and enjoy it that way too. Right. Beautiful. Um, so let's, let's return to cocktails. Um, if somebody were to walk in off the street, like they, they very almost nearly did a couple minutes right, <laughs> right before we started recording here and they said, Hey, I'd like to take this bottle home. What would you recommend to do with it? I usually drink, you know, mixed drinks as opposed to straight up. What, what, what would your recommendations be for this particular gin? So we have a couple different cocktails that we recommend to people with this gin. One is, uh, we're calling it a Dutch mule, which is this with just some Fentiman's ginger beer. Uh, and it's really important to find a ginger beer that is, doesn't have a high sugar content and also isn't too aggressive on the ginger, uh, so that it allows our, our spirit to shine through. Uh, so that's one thing that one cocktail that we, uh, recommend also we've been doing Negronis with this mm. so, uh, and pulling back a little bit on the Campari so instead of one to one to one in terms of one gin one Campari one vermouth we're doing one and a half gin uh, to one Campari one ver uh, white vermouth and it's it's allowing like we said we want cocktails that are going to let our spirit shine through but also give some of that uh, that mixer feel uh, that for people that enjoy that uh, and then another another interesting one that we've done is a Manhattan. And so we've been mixing that, mixing our gin with just a splash of bourbon and then uh, some sweet vermouth, some bitters, and an orange peel. Really uh, nice. Really nice. Yeah, I like that with the Negroni, you, uh, you kind of adjusted the ratios. And I was going to ask you what kind of sweet vermouth you're using because I, I had an agenda with that, but then you said you use white vermouth with it, which kind of answered my question, which was going to be like, all right, how do you emphasize the botanical profiles in this spirit? Because they are a little bit gentler than mm -hmm. a London dry style gin. And it seems like you did that by like, you know, pulling back on the ratios and then also using a lighter white vermouth. That's not going to be so heavy on its own infusions. Correct. Yeah, that's that's a really, really smart move. So um, we'll definitely list some of those cocktails over on the show notes page at modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast. So folks can head on over there if you are able to uh, pick up a bottle of this delicious juice. Um, so, you know, you can always just head over there and uh, mix those up for yourself at home. With the uh, apple brandies, or uh, so I guess you're you were totally sold out of the pear. That that went like wildfire. It did, yes. And so with the apple brandies, can you talk a little bit about how Calvados is traditionally made, and then um, like what you're planning, like how you're planning to roll that out? I guess logistically, uh, because it, it is in a barrel, which presents an additional layer of logistics as opposed to just a clear spirit like we just tasted. And then maybe we can get in some cocktails with that as well. Sure. We so we actually purchased an abandoned orchard in Western Maryland. So we're growing our own apples uh, and just transplanted a lot of trees that we've been growing from seedlings for a couple of years now. Oh wow! And so we're doing a lot of good cider variety apples. Uh, my brother-in-law Jeff, he's the he's the apple guy, and he knows all the different varieties uh, because unfortunately, a lot of the ciders uh, that are turned into apple brandy here in the U.S. are made from apples that are not good cider apples. And you know, we always say good stuff in, good stuff out. So if you're not using a good cider apple, you're not going to get a good brandy. So we're using all sorts of different types of apples that, um, that are t traditionally used for making cider. And the process is uh, we bring in whole fruit into this space and we crush it by hand uh, while well, we have a crusher. Uh, so we have an industrial uh, industrial crusher that we throw our apples in and then an industrial press that we then squeeze the juice out of and then we put it into barrels to ferment and we do a natural fermentation so what I'll, and that makes us unique in terms of distilleries and cideries across the nation I don't know of anybody else that's doing all natural fermentation for distilling which means that we don't throw in sulfites which would kill all the bacteria and then add in our own yeast which is the common practice in the US uh, when you do that you lose a lot of the character that natural yeast will give to a fermentation and you just get, sort of get that single variety of flavor that that yeast is meant to give. So we do a natural fermentation. Whatever yeast is living on that apple, that's what we're going to rely on to ferment. And it goes in a barrel for 
four months, five months. Uh, we want that fermentation to happen fully uh, and then we distill it. So it takes a long time for us to get even to the point to where we can distill the, the hard cider. Uh, and after we, we distill it uh, twice as is tradition in our Lambic style pot still and then put it back into a barrel to then age. So that's where we're at in the process right now. That is complicated. Yeah. <laughs> uh, definitely atypical. Uh, a little bit surprising. Uh, so a couple follow-ups on that process so you're you're fermenting these the whole fruit the crushed or is, is it just the juice or is there so, any, of, any solids so in it the depends on the fruit that we're using so for our pear brandy we crush we crushed the pears and then fermented with everything so okay. stems pulp everything Seeds, and that's yeah. yeah that's how you do uh, a pear make a pear wine uh with the apples we crush and then we put into our our apple press over here that okay. presses out all the juices and what's left is almost like a pancake of uh, apple pulp that we send to a farmer and feeds his pigs. Okay. So it's mo yeah. So I understand. So it's mostly the, the apple liquid going into these, uh, into these barrels. And then when you distill it and then put it back into the barrels to age, are you using those same barrels that you fermented in? So we actually have new, French oak barrels that we are aging that are toasted that we are aging the apple brandy in. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, cause that's where, you know, Calvados is a spirit that has that light golden color and it's, it's not coming from the apples. It's coming from the barrels. So mm -hmm. that makes sense. And then are you going to be, as your barrel program expands, are you going to be reusing some of these barrels and kind of blending in like, you know, second use, third use and kind of uh, using it that way? Or are you going to be using all new barrels all the time? So we'll use used barrels for fermentations, for aging different spirits like gin uh, and also aging for uh, apple brandies. You know, barrels do have a shelf life though. And so you can only use them so many times before they lose uh, all of their properties or start leaking, falling apart. So, uh, but we'll, we try to use them as much as we can, but we also have several breweries around here that are really interested in getting some of our used barrels, especially our used rye barrels uh, and our used apple barrels. So uh, we're not gonna have a problem getting rid of them. That's for sure. No, that is that is for certain. And I want, I'm gonna, I wanna point something out here to listeners at home that's really special about what you said and it might come with a potential problem but I want to I want to troubleshoot that problem with you and see how you handle it so one of the things that you mentioned in your explication of this traditional style of apple brandy barrel aging is or barrel fermentation I should say is that you don't add sulfites to the barrel and this is a very very common practice in the especially like the fortified wine world so you'll see um, like port barrels uh, when people are sourcing port barrels they are very concerned about about whether sulfur or sulfites have been used in this uh, in this process because that can have a really drastic effect on whatever they're finishing in that uh, port or sherry barrel, for example. The reason why they do this is to, as you mentioned, kind of kill some bacteria and stuff. So uh, obviously the one real benefit of you not doing that is that you, you have confidence that the barrels that you're using are gonna be really high quality unsulfured barrels. On the other hand, I mean, during this four month uh, fermentation, my big question is, how do you uh, control for contamination in that situation? Well, it's, it's sealed. So the barrel is sealed and we we do our best not to open it and taste it as often <laughs> as we can. It's hard sometimes because those ciders taste really good. Uh, when sure. that, they they start fermenting, you, and you're like, wow, that's really good cider. I just want to taste it one more time. But we try to hold ourselves to not opening it very often. And then it's just it's we have not yet had one turn into vinegar, which is something that could happen, right? It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a chance we're taking, uh, but the payoff of doing a natural fermentation uh, without adding anything that Mother Nature didn't provide uh, is worth uh, the risk of having one or two barrels maybe turned to vinegar over time. Absolutely, that, and that's a, that's a great approach to it. I, that's the approach that I would personally take if I were you know, in your position. I, I think it's a, a really uh, end product friendly approach and, uh, I do want to reassure people that I wasn't asking that question because I'm trying to imply in any way that the end product is going to be foiled or, you know, like kind of spoiled or anything uh, because everything does get killed when it goes through the still after that fermentation. I was just curious about like the potential of like, like you said, losing stuff that turns into vinegar because for every, every distiller, especially a startup loss is a huge risk factor and you want to try to avoid that. So um, really interesting to hear your thoughts on that. 
getting back to the cocktail side of, of that, can you take people through the flavor profile that you're expecting to get on this product that's, that's not yet out of the barrels? Good. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, yeah, just a very, uh, a very soft apple taste. Uh, with a little bit of wood, right? Mm -hmm. You're just you're just getting a hint of wood, right? We're using these light toasted barrels. We don't want it to take on too much. We're really just trying to to tone down some of the, some of the heat that uh, a clear apple spirit brings, uh, and then it's going to be something that you. Uh, can drink uh, room temperature or chilled or even throw in a little bit of coffee, which is what they do in France uh, as their morning uh, coffee. So. Interesting, interesting. Um, and so the difference between a toasted barrel versus a, a charred barrel is really whether or not it was set on fire, right? Mm -hmm. So so you, the, the staves for the barrels that were you, you were using to age the spirit were put into a, a massive oven. They were toasted for a certain amount of time until they got to a certain color and doneness, just kind of like a, like a pizza or a cookies or whatever else. Uh, and then they were reassembled into your barrel. Uh, and the big difference there, as you mentioned, is color. So that's why, you know, if you were putting this into a, uh, bourbon barrel that was charred, you know, to a three or a four char, you're going to be getting a much, much darker spirit that's not characteristic of what you're getting. So this is another thing that you're doing to kind of adhere as closely to the, to the tradition as possible while still putting your your local flair on it. Like you mentioned, those, ye those local yeasts that are sitting on those apples when they roll through your door are going to be completely different than anything that's in France. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a really unique fusion of the old world style but with a very localized and kind of uh, craft uh, kind of stamp on it for sure. Um, so w have you seen Calvados used in cocktails? Um, and, and if so, like how, how would you recommend someone picking up a Calvados or when your apple brandy is ready? What's the cocktail applications for that? Well, I do know that uh, apple brandy used to actually be the prevalent uh, mixer for cocktails uh, before prohibition and so uh, almost taking the place of whiskey but in terms of specific cocktails uh, there is there, there's a great cocktail book uh, the name is escaping my mind but it's got a lot of great uh, apple brandy cocktails I just don't have them in front of me so. okay well we'll try and get that yeah. up on the show notes page uh, when I first came across Calvados I invented the first cocktail that I ever invented I was so proud of myself and in <laughs> hindsight it's just a Calvados Manhattan uh, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> but I was so proud of myself and it tasted really good. So I'll, I'll, um, uh, I'll slap that up on the show notes page uh, over at modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast. Uh, that, that cocktail is called the Flower of Normandy. And basically what I did is I just took two ounces of Calvados and I added to that a half ounce of elderflower liqueur. Saint Germain. It was that this was at the time when Saint Germain was just starting to really hit the market with the full force of its elderflower power. Uh, people call it the bartender's ketchup these days. And uh, and then to that, I added uh, several dashes of our embitterment orange bitters, and then uh, just a nice little expressed orange twist. And it was it was a beautiful, beautiful drink. And again, in hindsight, it's just a Calvados Manhattan. Sounds great. You'll have to come and make it for us when our Calvados comes out. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I'd love to do that. Um, but it's it's really easy to do at home, right? And it's it's one of those classic ratios, so it's it's really easy to remember. Is there anything else uh, that you want to tell our listeners about your process, your products, uh, or even like a, maybe a projected timeline of when people should look to come and visit and taste some of this stuff? Sure. We're, we're open on the weekends from noon to four and we do full tastings and full tours here. So you get to hear all of this from me again. Uh, but uh, you get to experience um, our gin currently right now four different ways we want you to sample it so you know uh all the different ways that you can try it and uh it's really a fun experience and hyattsville is a great place to come visit and it's really booming there's a brewery a meadery uh there's actually two breweries and a meadery and a distillery so there's lots of options for people to come uh and check out this city yeah and then i would also highly recommend checking out franklin's which is just across the street 
I used to live in Hyattsville. Uh, it's right adjacent to College Park, which is where I went to grad school. And uh, Franklin's makes incredible pub grub, and they have their own kind of brew pub atmosphere. Yep, yep. they're one of the breweries. So yeah, uh, I recommend the Vulcan Mind Meld. Um, that's a that's a really badass take on a spicy little spicy Reuben action, which I believe uh, is only on the lunch menu now. So oh no! <laughs> All right, good good pro tip. And yeah, I can't go wrong with Franklin's and there's a lot of other great, um, you know, just food and shopping around here as well. It's uh, right on Route 1 in in Hyattsville, Maryland. So that being said, Nate, you ready for a couple lightning round questions? All right, let's let's see if we can do this. All right. Uh, so what's your favorite cocktail? And if you don't have a favorite of all time, what's something that you've more recently been in love with? Uh, I love Manhattans and so have really uh, tried to find different ways to drink different types of Manhattans. And then when, when we figured out our gin could be in a Manhattan, I was thrilled. And so love Manhattans. Fantastic. Now y- you are about to create a rye whiskey and we haven't really, we haven't really mentioned this. So it's, it's sitting in a barrel. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the style of the rye whiskey that you're making? What kind of makes it special and, um, you know, what you're, what you're looking at in terms of mash bill and how long it's going to be in the barrel, stuff yeah, like so that. So we're, we're attempting to do a traditional Maryland rye, which means only rye and barley. Uh, those are the two traditional uh, grains that are used uh, to make a Maryland rye whiskey, and we're aging it in new oak uh, barrels that are charred. And typically, uh, it doesn't need to age uh, more than 12 months. So we're we're using small barrels. Uh, we're exposing them to the elements. So we're hoping that it'll it'll be ready to come out maybe uh, by Thanksgiving. Okay. So, but we'll you know what we'll do is we'll just keep opening the barrels and tasting them, and uh, hopefully we leave some for the customers. Yeah, <laughs> totally, totally. Um, so. So what's the mash? Are you keeping your mash bill proprietary or are you, you willing to share no, that? We're, we're right around 60% rye, 40% barley right now. Okay. Um, and we're, we're still experimenting because like I said, we're getting different types of grains that are giving us different fermentations. So we're ramping up the rye on some and we're pulling, ramping up the barley on others. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's always going to be more than 50% rye. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's really cool. So the Manhattan, man, another another person you know, on Team Manhattan. Um, well, I've, I've got a, a bottle of orange bitters here that we'll we'll check out off af- after we uh, uh, finish recording here, and maybe you can start using those in your home Manhattans. Nice. So, if you were a cocktail tool or ingredient, what would you be, and why? I would be a shot glass, uh, just because. I, I like to drink things uh, in their purest form just to taste them first before I want to make any type of cocktail. So uh, I would be shot glass, maybe only filled halfway, but uh, yeah. that's how I like to try my liquor. I like it. It shows it shows focus. And that's, I mean, to be honest, like if, you know, if Jeff were here, you know, might be a different story, but for your distiller, that's what you want. You want that focus and you <laughs> want that, that kind of uh, concentrated uh, approach to things, which is, which is really great. Does your background as, as a math teacher uh, also, also also play into your distilling approach? Uh, yeah, I, it's it's interesting. Uh, sometimes it helps and sometimes it hurts because uh, I'm being a mathematical mind. I'm always looking for, you know, logical things that are happening and try to set parameters as to how, okay, this should take this long, this should take this long, this should take this long. But when you get into it, it, it you realize that distilling is much more of an art than it is a science. And it really has to do with your taste. And so you're constantly tasting and you're like, well, after after seven hours, this should be getting to a point where I'm starting to cut it off. But right now, I'm at, I'm at eight hours, and it still tastes great, so I'm going to keep collecting this as my hearts. Uh, so that's... It, it helps me in terms of organizing what I have to do day to day, but in terms of the... Uh, the actual artistry of knowing when to make your cuts when distilling, uh, it's, it doesn't help one bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You really, you're not fighting against the world of abstract figures and forms. You're, you're fighting against the world of, of molecules and microbes. Yep. And those things are just running, running amok below our level of consciousness. And it, we can only react to it. We can't, we can't really, uh, we can't really set a fixed set of parameters mm-hmm. that's going to work the same thing, the same way day in and day out in the yeah. distillery. Yeah. Not, especially not on our scale. I mean, we, you know, we are the definition of craft here. We are so small that we, every batch is a little different. Yeah. So. And that's part of the romance for me. Um, so here's the Widowmaker question. If, if you could have a cocktail with anyone in the world, past or present, uh, who would it be? Where would you go? What would you drink? Like just kind of paint us a picture. So I think I would like to go to, uh, 
to the Netherlands, maybe about 150, 175 years ago to meet my great grandfather and sit with him in a cafe with some Jennifer and, and drink it with him and talk to him about what it's going to be like for them to get on this boat, uh, to come to America. Oh, wow. And so I think that would be really cool to have that experience, uh, in sipping the, the liquor that I'm making now that they were having over there then. Yeah. That's like a more meta answer than we usually get, because usually people, when they have this, this opportunity to go pack, uh, talk to somebody who, who may not be around anymore they want to they want to just like take 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 like uh, uh, what was this like what was this like but you're like you're like oh here I'm gonna bring my Jennifer back in time with me and let him taste it that's like so that's such a, a cool like gift to want to give somebody who is almost like in a way the inspiration for what you're doing mm -hmm. now so that's a really cool answer uh, so are there any books besides the one that we're gonna try and, and pop up on the show notes page for folks uh, that, that are particularly influential for you as you um, kind of got into the distillation game? Yes. Uh, Traditional Distillation, Art and Passion by Hubert Germain Robin uh, is a... Uh, a book that I've read just over and over again, talking about distilling and really bringing you through the science and the art of it together and is a, is a great book. Yeah, Robin is definitely a, a very influential figure in distillation on an international scale. Um, so we'll, we'll put a link to that book in the show notes. Um, and, you know, did you pick that up as you were setting up your distillery? Did you did you read this before you even purchased a still? Like, where, how, where did it fall into your education? So I believe that Jeff had the book. And as we were talking about different, uh, different methods, he says, read this because I think this is really, we want to be on the same page in terms of how things are going. And uh, he said it's got a lot of great information for it. So I read it. Uh, and so that was right about the time that we were getting the project uh, here in Hyattsville full steam ahead in terms of starting our build out and starting to get equipment and think about the types of processes that we needed to do in the space. Right. Yeah. It's just so crucial. Like, I think if there's one takeaway that I have from our, our, our conversation today, that is, it's like, as especially if you're just getting things off the ground, it's really crucial to consider your process and really not just figure out the how, but then like also figure out how that relates to the why, you know, why are we doing this and how are we going to build that mission into the way that we do it? And that's, it seems like you've done a really good job fully considering that. And, and uh, it's been really special to kind of learn about that. So if you have any advice for somebody who is just starting to get into the types of spirits that you're making, which are a little bit atypical besides the rye whiskey for the American palate, perhaps, um, what would you recommend? How would you recommend somebody start learning about these things and, and learning to incorporate them into their, their drinking repertoire? You know, there's, there are really good cocktail bars around, and I would go to those cocktail bars, and I would talk to your local bartender. Uh, make friends with bartenders. It's a good thing. They know a lot. Uh, it's it's what they're doing for a living, and so it's their job to know uh, all about different types of spirits. And so have conversations with them. Uh, ask them about different types of uh, spirits that they're seeing that uh, you haven't used before, and they will give you great ideas on how to use them. Uh, another avenue I go, if, if you're looking at different spirits and you're like, ah, I don't know about this, read the bottle. Really read the label and see if you can uh, understand the process that they're using to make their spirit or do research on uh, by talking to the distiller or going to their website. Uh, find out process. I think that's really important when you're trying a new spirit. Uh, there are lots of different ways that people are making spirits and some of them might not be the way that you think they should be made and you don't want to pay that for the way that they're doing it. So be educated. That's that's my one piece of advice is really educate yourself on the, the different methods that different st distilleries are using to make their products. Yeah, that really is what makes craft special because everyone's got their own fingerprint and, um, you know, it's okay to not like something, but it, one of the things that I always urge our listeners to do is to know why they don't like something, right? And, and, to, not, and to not have that that reason be, oh, because, because I just, I, I don't know, like just mm -hmm. kind of a generic because, mm -hmm. uh, have a reason. And, you know, it makes you a more informed drinker and a more interesting, um, you know, kind of uh, person in the flavor world. So that's fantastic. Nate, can you just remind us again, give us a, a street address and then, uh, remind us of your hours and tell us where we, we can, uh, say hello to you all on social media. Sure. Uh, we are located at 5130 Baltimore Avenue in Hyattsville, Maryland. Our 
tasting room hours are noon to 4 p.m. on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, if you want to do a private event, go ahead and get in contact with us, and we can do that too. Uh, our website is www.sangfroidistilling.com, and you can find us on Facebook at Sangfroid Distilling. You can find us on Instagram, Sangfroid Distilling, and you can find us on Twitter, I think, Sangfroid Brandy. So one difference in there ah. for, for Twitter. It's uh, Sangfroid Brandy. I know, but, they got uh, us too. But yeah. you, can, you can find us there uh, and definitely hook up uh, on one of those events. Uh, one of those platforms and you'll find out when new products are coming out so you can be first in line to, to get it before we run out. Yes, and as we've heard, they do run <laughs> out. So uh, if you're interested and you're in the area, please do subscribe. And in the same vein of talking to your bartender, if you're in the area, talking to your bartender, maybe you should also remind them about the existence of these really cool spirits that are going to be coming out in the next couple months so that they can be first in line to get this behind their bar as well. I know that uh, Nate and Jeff would appreciate it. And having tasted this stuff, it's just begging to be in a really great cocktail program. So please do that if you're local. Uh, if you're having any trouble uh, finding the stuff or you just want more information, uh, you can hit us up by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com. And we'll also be happy to connect you to sang Distilling and any of our other local partners who we work with. So uh, thanks for listening. And Nate, thank you for being on the show today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and production assistance by Samantha Reed, Dutch Courage, and some really nice apple brandy, courtesy of Nate Grenendike of Safwad Distilling, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2019.